Preeclampsia is a common condition during pregnancy characterized by high blood pressure. Without treatment, it can lead to serious, even fatal complications for both mother and baby. Today on At The Forefront Live, you can have your questions answered by our experts. That's coming up now on At The Forefront Live. And today on At The Forefront Live, we have Dr. Sarush Rana and Nurse Makaria Salache joining us. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Quick reminder, everyone, the show is not designed to take the place of a visit with your healthcare professional, but please ask lots of questions and you can type them in the comment section right below the, uh, the picture there, and we'll get to as many as we can over the next half hour. Let's start off with the basics, though, and doctor, if you can kind of start us off and just tell us, what is preeclampsia? So thank you, Tim, uh, so much for having us here. Um, so preeclampsia is a common uh, condition in pregnancy, like Tim mentioned. It is essentially characterized by high blood pressures, and you can sometimes have protein in your urine. Um, so that's kind of the basic definition of preeclampsia. Many patients, though, with preeclampsia can have other uh, associated symptoms, such as they can have seizures. Uh, sometimes the patients can have liver dysfunction, even kidney dysfunction, and small size babies. So what actually causes preeclampsia? So good question. I think if you ask me in one sentence, the um, cause of preeclampsia is not really known, but it's a placental disease. Mm -hmm. So essentially what happens is um, somehow, and people have looked at it, there are certain autoantibodies, genetic factors, even environmental factors that can affect your placenta, which can essentially then uh, people believe release some of these factors which can cause preeclampsia. And one of the things that surprised me, and I, I mentioned in the, the intro that it's, it's actually, it's more common than people might, might think. Yeah, so the prevalence of, of as if that, uh, how common it is varies by uh, country to country and also different uh, races. So preeclampsia in general uh, is about 7 to 8 percent. So in some certain populations, definitely at the University of Chicago, it's even more common. So about 17 percent of our patients have some sort of high blood pressures in pregnancy. So yeah, so you can say 1 in 10 women will suffer from it. And Makaria, let's bring you into the conversation a little bit and just tell us a little sure. bit about what you do here at uh, UChicago Medicine to start, please. Okay, thank you, Tim. So um, I've been a labor and delivery nurse here for about 14 years, and I've seen a lot of success stories on um, us treating our preeclamptic patients, but the ones that stick uh, close to home are the ones that we couldn't, um, that got late care or didn't come in for care, and that made me uh, ask myself what I could do more. And so what, uh, what happened then? Um, our patients were coming back uh, after having birth and um, seizing, coming into our ER. The, uh, the ER didn't know necessarily how to treat these moms or didn't realize that this was preeclampsia. So um, I joined Dr. Rana's team uh, to come up with ways to help prevent this in our institution. And, and that's why we're here today. This is World Preeclampsia Day as well. So we want to get the word out to people exactly, you know, what preeclampsia is, the fact that it is more common than people oftentimes think, and, and preventative measures, what to take, what to be aware of as well. I think that's very important. And, and uh, so let's talk a little bit about the, the folks that are at risk. And uh, uh, can you kind of go through that for us? Sue? Yeah, so there are um, certain identified risk factors for somebody to develop preeclampsia. So obviously, um, and I joke about it, the risk factor is that you're pregnant, so men can't <laughs> get it. Um, but if you're nully paris, so if this is your first pregnancy, if you have high blood pressures, um, African-American patients are um, at high risk not only to develop preeclampsia, but more importantly to develop complications related to preeclampsia. Obesity is a risk factor, even IVF pregnancy, patients who have kidney transplants or renal dysfunction, diabetes. So there are a whole host of risk factors for the disease. And so Makaria, from your standpoint, that was very important to you to really <clears throat> get the word out to women so that they knew what to, to be aware of and what to look for. That's almost been kind of a, a, a calling for you, is that correct? That's correct. So my call to action was um, when I realized that only 30% of our patients were coming back for postpartum care, and that was very scary. Can we talk a little bit about postpartum care and how critical sure. that is for, for people, so, and not only for the mom, but for, for, the, for the baby as well? Right, so um, I think everything starts with educating our patients. Um, we've had 
a lot of our patients say that they thought preeclampsia ended with delivery, and that is not the case. And um, <coughs> through education, um, we stress that it can go on up to six weeks, um, pre the preeclampsia problems, if not longer. One of the things that I thought was interesting, uh, there was an interview that uh, you had done with a patient, and we're going to play a little clip from that interview, and it talks about some of the things that she was told to be aware of. And, and John, if we can go ahead and roll that, and then we'll talk a little bit about that afterwards. My doctor said to me, there's something I want you to look for. If you see a color wheel go across your eyes, I want you to go directly to the emergency room. And I asked, what does that mean? And he said, because your blood pressure has been a little elevated these past couple of appointments. That was the only instructions that I received. I remember it was a Sunday morning. I was getting ready for church. I took a shower. I got off the shower and the color wheel went across my vision. I said, this is so pretty. And then I remembered this is something that I need to call my doctor about. When I was getting ready to tell my daughter's father that we need to call the doctor, after that I don't have any memory. So, so she's talking about a color wheel going across her vision? What, what is she referring to? So um, sometimes when you have preeclampsia, and this uh, our patient uh, here that we uh, just showed, she actually ended up having an eclamptic seizure. So that's something that when you have a severe preeclampsia, you can actually have a seizure. And a majority of patients who have a seizure complain of headaches sometimes and also this kind of flashing lights and spots in front of your eyes, mm -hmm. and that's just from edema in the brain. Uh, so that's obviously a very, very severe symptom, um, and she ended up having a seizure and ended up delivering early, actually, because of that. And Macario, when you see patients come in at, 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 and they're going through this situation, what, what's done from your standpoint? The first thing we, we do is we um, educate the patient um, of what, what, what is happening because it is very stressful and scary. Yeah. So um, let them know that they're in the best care and um, what the treatment is. Yeah, I imagine that would be a very scary experience if you, if you don't know that this is happening or don't know what's happening and, and this comes on all of a sudden. And in her case, it sounds like it was, it was completely out of the blue. She didn't anticipate this at all. And I, I would agree, and I think that's a major problem in terms of, um, and that's why we are big into um, education. So there's not only systematic um, lack of knowledge, uh, I want to say, um, in terms of uh, patients don't know what they uh, they have, but also if they are at risk, even at risk for it, but also the providers. So a couple of years ago, I did a study in Boston, and it, I, it was very clear that people who are seeing these patients in postpartum setup, for example, I did it in between cardiologists, they don't even know the association, for example, between uh, preeclampsia and cardiovascular disease. So what we have created here as a part of our uh, initiative is we have a video that we created uh, uh, for all our patients, which is the snippet we just showed, which everybody who has preeclampsia, eclampsia actually watches that video. Um, and if they have hypertension, to educate the patients, um, at least start there with patient education for her to know exactly what she's suffering from and uh, what are her risks. Well, and it's great that they can hear from other patients and, and really hear that in lay people's terms. I think that's important. So we've got a question from one of our viewers that I want to throw out at, at at you for an answer and it says I was diagnosed with preeclampsia and that same evening had a blood pressure of 248 went to the mm -hmm. ER had my baby the same day what could I have done to prevent it it's been 22 days now my blood pressure is, uh, is normal uh, and I'm on the highest dosages of three different blood pressure medications my headaches are awful without the meds and Tylenol and Advil what can I do to get better so um, thank you for sharing um, this question yeah, so postpartum hypertension is a common problem actually. Uh, about 50% of the patients, so one in two people who have preeclampsia will have postpartum hypertension. Um, it can, um, and I know you had preeclampsia and then had hypertension, but just for everybody's knowledge, you can have new onset hypertension just after having the baby. So we are actually giving instructions to anybody who delivers is at risk for postpartum hypertension. I think for you specifically, I would suggest, seems like you are taking your medications. A um, large majority of patients your blood pressure should normalize and sometimes it takes time and like Makari was saying even sometimes I've seen patients who need medications for even like a year or even two out so I would just keep your care with your cardiologist with the medicine doctor that you are seeing and continue to take your medications. 
And of course, if you're experiencing anything that you think is out of the ordinary significant, make sure you contact your physician. Call your doctors, physician. yes. So uh, one of the questions that uh, we had was, are, are certain women, such as African-American women, at higher risk of developing complications? And if so, why? So the question, um, the second question, why is a, is a difficult one, but yes, so there is uh, uh, definitely women who are African American race that are at higher risk to develop complications related to pregnancy in general. Um, and there is lots of data that the maternal mortality, so just frankly mothers dying in pregnancy is about three to four and in some literature about six times higher in women who are African American. And it's so unfortunate that this has been continuing for six decades. So for the past 60 years, more African-American women are dying from pregnancy-related complications. Um, now, if you ask me why, I think it's a, it's a combination of physician lack of awareness for preventable causes that we can work at hospital levels for lack of access to care. And I personally believe there's some systematic bias against women and the, the care that they receive. And and central to what you do and your belief is education, you're trying to get the word out, and, and awareness. I think that's also very important. Yes, and hospital level interventions, so such as we have, we participated in the ILPQC, which was Management of Acute Severe Hypertension. We have AIM bundles, which are, uh, uh, which are bundles that hospitals adopt. And so, yeah, I think hospital level interventions for every patient, every time, correct management. Now the patient we just saw a moment ago, I think we have one more sound bite and let's go ahead and hear from her again and we'll, we'll chat about that in a minute. The next memory I have is waking up at the University of Chicago actually in labor and delivery. I had already been moved from the emergency department to a room. I found out that I had an eclamptic seizure. I was 35 weeks when I had my daughter and we stayed in the hospital for a few days. She was in the neonatal intensive care unit. About a little over a year later, I was diagnosed with chronic hypertension. After going to see my primary care physician, he did a lot of tests. We did my family history, and then he asked me about my delivery. When he saw the records that I had the eclamptic episode, he wanted to start putting together if there was a connection between the preeclampsia and my chronic hypertension. So she mentions hypertension, as you mentioned just a few moments ago. There, it, it seems like that's an interesting connection. And and what what do you? Th how many women have you found? Is it very common for them to suffer from hypertension and then uh, preeclampsia? Yeah. So. Um Previously, a few years ago, people would believe that, you know, perhaps it's the long term, it takes 10 years, 12 years, but there's recent data that women who have preeclampsia are about 25 times higher chance to have hypertension at one year, within a year of their delivery, compared to women who had a normal tensile delivery. And then in terms of cardiovascular risks, such as history of MI, you can have MI, cardio uh, cerebrovascular accidents, such as a stroke. Um, there is about a two percent, a two-fold increase. So that increase is as much as cigarette smoking. So pre history of preeclampsia puts a woman at higher risk to have cardiovascular disease as much as, for example, somebody who's smoking. So pretty significant risk. So Makaria, when you work with women that come in and you educate them and teach them about preeclampsia, what do you find are some of the most common misconceptions? Um, the most common and the most dangerous one is when they believe that once the baby is out that they're cured, that their the preeclampsia is gone. Yeah. And you mentioned up to six weeks after yes. uh, delivery? If not longer. Wow. So that's pretty significant. And I, I do think that's something that probably a lot of people don't realize. That's yeah, correct. That is actually correct. Yeah. Uh, so we're getting more questions from our viewers. Uh, the next one is, since I've had preeclampsia, I've started experiencing migraines. Is that normal? I don't think there's a direct link between preeclampsia and migraines. Um, there is a connection between preeclampsia and Alzheimer's many years later, but um, I think your migraines are probably unrelated to your preeclampsia uh, postpartum, definitely. Um, I would just see a neurologist to make sure it's not something that's significant and more than the migraine. So that's a fascinating point. There is a connection between mm -hmm. preeclampsia and Alzheimer's later mm -hmm. in life. Mm -hmm. Wow, um, that's, that's, that's very interesting mm -hmm. and kind of alarming as well. Yes, I know. Very few studies done on that. Huh. 
Uh, more questions from our viewers. We're getting quite a few. Keep them coming. We love them. Uh, is there any connection between maternal uh, malnutrition or being underweight prior to pregnancy at conception and the development of preeclampsia? So I guess it, nutrition is what they're you know, talking good about. Good question. Um, actually, when epidemiologically people have looked at it, people who are underweight are also at significantly higher risk to develop preeclampsia. I'm exactly not sure, and I don't think there's literature as to why like there's a particular nutrient, but certainly being underweight also puts you at risk to have preeclampsia. You know, it's interesting because we get so many physicians and scientists on the program, and, and they talk about how critically important nutrition is yes. just in general, yes. and here's another example. Yes. Uh, very, very important. So again, from an education standpoint, if you are pregnant, you need to see your provider and talk to somebody like uh, Macaria too as well to, to get information about proper nutrition and how to be healthy throughout that pregnancy. That makes a big difference, right? That's correct. And I want to put a plug in with the last question is uh, about, um, uh, and even in general about recurrence of preeclampsia. I don't know if you have a question about that. But if you had preeclampsia in your prior pregnancy, you should certainly seek some sort of a high risk care. So definitely have your obstetrician be aware. And aspirin, taking aspirin every day from about 12 weeks onwards till 36 weeks is the only preventative strategy that we have to prevent preeclampsia. So make sure that you talk to your physician about aspirin. So if you've experienced preeclampsia before, you're more likely? Yes, or if you have risk factors. So the risk factors that I enumerated in the, in the beginning, uh, mm -hmm. there are good guidelines about who these patients should be. So essentially, if you're obese and you're African-American, you pretty much should be getting aspirin throughout your pregnancy. And that's, um, I would like to put the plug in to kind of remind your physicians and also for the physicians to, to see if your patient uh, will benefit from aspirin uh, therapy. Which is, is very much uh, in line with this question we just received from a viewer. And, and she had pre severe preeclampsia starting at 19 weeks, delivered at 23 mm -hmm. weeks. She's pregnant again. She's worried about getting it again. And so you just so answered that. So aspirin, yeah. yes, would be something that you should do. And then in my clinic, I see a lot of hypertensives. I do a hypertension clinic for pregnancy. I give all my patients blood pressure cuffs, so you should ask your doctor whether home blood pressure monitoring is something that they would recommend you to do. Know your signs and symptoms of preeclampsia, and we can enumerate them. So headache, blurred vision, swelling of your face, uh, pain. severe pain in your abdomen, abdomen. Um, and then kind of keep going over those signs and make sure that you are in touch with your care provider um, um, to tell them that obviously you had this severe preeclampsia so early in your pregnancy. And you mentioned blood pressure monitoring at home. Is that mm -hmm. something that you would do on a daily basis? Um, or? So kind of depends on who you are, but you can do once a day blood pressure monitoring. Sometimes if my patients are not on antihypertensives, I say maybe two times a week, and they can record those blood pressures, and you can bring them to your physician's um, office. There's actually data that blood pressures at home can be a higher about a week before your doctors will catch it, and then mm -hmm. I teach them about what are, for example, severe blood pressures, such as 160 or 100, okay. 110 that's when you can call your doctor. So if you have symptoms, you can check your blood pressure, and if it's really high, you can call your physician. So just kind of empowering my patients and empowering yourself to be uh, kind of uh, take care of your health. Another question from a viewer, is nicotine a risk factor? So if you're a smoker, so that's a good you shouldn't question. smoke anyway if you're pregnant. No, you should so, not smoke, yeah. but I don't even want to say this, but smoking is the only risk factor that reduces your prevalence for preeclampsia. Uh -oh. But Smoking increases so many other complications, such yeah. as you are at risk for preterm delivery. I would not recommend that, but scientifically, um, yes, there's been epidemiological studies showing that. Interesting. I would have never mm, guessed no. that one. Yeah. Uh, more questions. I was diagnosed with gestational hypertension in my first pregnancy three years ago. I was on watch for preeclampsia, but did not get the diagnosis. Took a low dose of aspirin, just as you said, with my second pregnancy. I developed preeclampsia in my 34th week and had to deliver baby mm -hmm. at 34 weeks, five days this April. Is there anything else that could have been done to prevent preeclampsia? Are my chances of developing preeclampsia even higher in future pregnancies? That's a long one, but uh, it's a good one. So not really. So for the first part, um, aspirin is really just the only recommended thing that's been proven in large studies to prevent preeclampsia. Um, yeah, not diet. Um, I tell all my patients to do some moderate degree of exercise because I kind of believe that you kind of need to be a little bit more holistic. But no, nothing else that you could have done. Um, I would say that since you had preeclampsia first time or gestational hypertension first time and then had early preeclampsia less than 34 weeks or around 34 weeks, mm -hmm. I think you are at significant risk to develop preeclampsia if you get pregnant again. So I would just kind of watch through the things that I just talked about. Now the question is caffeine a risk factor? No. 
No. no, that's an easy one. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't even want to go into detail, but no, the short answer is no. Great. So if you're African-American and obese, this is another question, should you take aspirin throughout your pregnancy even before a preeclampsia diagnosis? Yeah, so very good point. I think I didn't make it clear. So aspirin is a prevention for preeclampsia. So if you're at high risk, so if you have high blood pressure or like you said, you're African-American and obese, yes. So you start your aspirin at 12 weeks to 16 weeks, somewhere there, so after your first trimester, and then I continue my patients all the way through delivery. So it's for, to prevent preeclampsia, not once you have preeclampsia. So Makaria, tell us, talk to us a little bit about uh, just the education process, both pre and post delivery. What kind of things uh, do you tell moms? What, what do they need to know? So um, after the provider talks to them about their diagnosis, we go through it again, uh, make sure that they understand what was said to them. We talk about how the delivery is gonna look like, um, um, if the baby you know, might have a little bit of distress afterwards, if they're on magnesium. We talk to them about their medications, what that means for them, um, if, how they're restricted with that. Um, and then postpartum, we, uh, uh, standardize the care so that we're all teaching them the same thing yeah. and we're running through every single um, detail of what they need to know when they're at home and we give them numbers to call when they have a question. Um, we also have been giving them blood pressure cuffs to take their blood pressure at home and we talk about how to take their blood pressure, how not to take their blood pressure at home and um, we give them also a medical alert band that says preeclampsia and postpartum on the back so that if they were to go to an emergency room that they can communicate that, that they are um, a postpartum preeclamptic patient. Uh, that, sounds, that sounds perfect. And I imagine it's a little overwhelming if you are being treated, if you're in the hospital, sometimes the information comes at you pretty fast. So uh, it's, it's, it's great that you're taking the time to really kind of walk through the, the steps and what, what needs to be done with, with, uh, with moms and, and families. That's, I think that's great. A question in here that uh, I, I neglected to ask earlier, but it's a good one. Does preeclampsia impact the child, my baby? So, I was just going to say that we've been talking for yeah. almost uh, uh, 20 minutes now about the moms. Yes, so obviously preeclampsia affects the baby. Right. Preeclampsia is actually the most common indication for a preterm delivery. So almost about 42%, so about 50% of the babies are born preterm, iatrogenically, so somebody's delivering them because of preeclampsia. Um, and yeah, and preeclampsia still is killing moms and still is killing babies. It's a common cause for growth restriction, for preterm delivery, for days in the ICU, um, and also fetal deaths. Question from a viewer, and this one is, is, is kind of a this is a big question. So should you not get pregnant if you've had multiple pregnancies with preeclampsia? And I imagine that kind of depends on the individual, obviously. You know, I don't know. I, um, I do take care of a lot of patients who, have, who are very high risk. I never tell a patient don't get pregnant. If yeah. that's what she wants to do, we are here to help. We describe the risks. I think the absolute risk is still not, I never tell any patient your risk to have preeclampsia is 100%. I think if you have other underlying conditions, so if you have lupus, if you have antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, if there's something else systematically, um, I think those patients are significant risk for having recurrent preeclampsia. Um, I think it's like such an individual discussion that has to be held between what the patient's values are, um, rather than kind of a global statement, I would say. And, and again, it's it's about awareness and education. And yes. when you have a great team like Dr. Rana and, and Makaria to help you through the process if you aren't you know, if you are high risk, that obviously makes a difference. Mm. And we appreciate you doing that. So uh, if, if somebody actually does have preeclampsia, we've touched on this a little bit, but what are the, the treatment uh, methods? So the uh, big picture, the treatment, there is no treatment for preeclampsia. The treatment for preeclampsia is, and I don't want to say this in a virtual sense, but it is essentially for some of the maternal syndrome is delivery. So once you deliver the patient, a large majority of the symptoms that she's having and blood pressure is usually resolved, barring the fact that you can obviously develop and continue to have postpartum blood pressures. Um, but you know, if you're preterm, we do try to do something called expectant management. So we, uh, we keep them in the hospital. The management includes controlling blood pressures. For patients who have severe disease, we give them magnesium, which is uh, an IV medication that uh, helps prevent seizures. Um, and then we give betamethasone, for example, it's a drug that we give to, um, to mature baby's lungs. 
Um, and then we obviously keep them in the hospital, review their labs, review their blood pressures, and time delivery um, to optimize the fetal growth. Are there any new developments in the management of, of preeclampsia? Um, so not uh, uh, research-wise, yes. So actually at the University of Chicago, we are doing um, uh, an FDA study. We're going to start that. I've been studying biomarkers to predict adverse outcomes in preeclampsia for almost about 15 years. And some of these biomarkers are actually now being hopefully put in front of the FDA to be approved for perhaps prompt diagnosis or even management decisions for patients with preeclampsia. So if you will, talk to us a little bit more about long-term effects. You mentioned Alzheimer's is, is one. Are there other long-term impacts? Yeah, so cardiovascular disease is the number one. So it's your risk to have an MI, it's risk to have your cerebrovascular disease such as stroke, severe hypertension, and then very long-term is Alzheimer's. But cardiovascular disease would be, and hypertension would be the most common uh, uh, long-term effect of preeclampsia. Because you mentioned seeing a cardiologist earlier. So is this something that commonly happens with? So unfortunately, no, and I think the, you know, AHA very recently, I think it was in 2015 when they actually put preeclampsia as one of the risk factors for uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, in our institution here, once the patient, so one thing that Makaria was, she was saying is that we actually created a postpartum hypertension clinic where all these patients are coming back. And once we see these patients immediately, we in postpartum seven, 10 days out, we actually have collaboration with our cardiologist and we send them to cardiologists for long-term follow-up. And Makari, I would imagine that the postpartum hypertension clinic, that's a, a fairly unusual thing, I would guess, right? It's, yes, it's Not new to- Not many people to, are doing that? It's new to our institution, yeah. and um, uh, it's an important part of our program. And what happens there? So, um, I mentioned earlier, we give the moms their blood pressure cuff, mm -hmm. um, so they have to do something with that information. So, um, they come to our clinic, and they give us their log, um, a provider reviews the log and sees if um, treatment needs to be done or treatment needs to be adjusted mm -hmm. um, and go from there. So we are just about out of time. If you would want to leave the moms watching or families watching with a parting thought, what would it be? So I would say just be uh, your own advocate. Like I said, be aware of your symptoms. It's a real thing. Um, it's a very common complication that can happen to you or to your family member. I would also say that ask a lot of questions. And you know, obviously, um, there are lots of websites. Um, there's a very good patient-driven website such as preeclampsia.org. You can like empower yourself with knowledge. And I would say ask your physicians and push them to make sure that they're doing like they're diagnosing it correctly and treating it correctly too. So I would just say be, be your own advocate. Uh, in terms of pushing and improving your care. Makari, any final thoughts for our viewers? I would like to say that in order to take care of your baby, you need to take care of yourself. And you need to um, think about that, uh, coming back to your clinic and making sure that you're healthy for your baby. Perfect. Well, that's all we t the time we have for the program. Uh, you guys were fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being on, and thank you for all of the uh, wonderful questions that you uh, gave for our experts. If you want any more information, please contact the Maternal Fetal Medicine Physician Team at 773-702-6118, or you can visit the online site at uchicagomedicine.org slash high hyphen risk hyphen OB. Thanks for watching, and have a great week.